السلام عليكم I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak This is a presentation to some of the practical aspects of anatomy of the oesophagus, stomach, duodenum and spleen uh, starting with the abdominal part of the oesophagus you know the oesophagus has a long part which is inside the thorax in the superior and posterior mediastinum but we are now talking about the abdominal part of the oesophagus this part is short it enters the abdomen via the opening in the, in the diaphragm the oesophageal opening of the diaphragm that lies at the level of T10 vertebra uh, to the left of the midline sometime it is described as um, oesophageal opening or hiatus of the diaphragm then after passing through this opening the abdominal oesophagus deviates downward and to the left to be connected with the stomach the connection with the stomach is called cardiac orifice of the stomach that is uh, at the level of t11 vertebra the entry to the diaphragm is t10 the entry to the stomach is t11 as you can see in this figure showing that the liver is anterior to the abdominal oesophagus we can say that the abdominal part of the oesophagus lie is covered anteriorly by the left lobe of the liver and uh, behind it is the uh, left cross of the diaphragm and uh, we can see that this abdominal part of the oesophagus has a, a left border and right border this is a left border and right border this is left border and right border sorry for that disturbance uh, the left border is separated from the greater curvature of the stomach this is the greater curvature of the stomach it is separated from the left border of the uh, stomach the left border is separated from the greater curvature of the stomach by an angle which is called uh, cardiac notch this is an angle between the left border of the oesophagus and the greater curvature of the stomach cardiac notch while the right border of the abdominal part of the oesophagus is in continuity with the lesser curvature of the stomach uh, the abdominal part of the oesophagus when it enters the abdomen through the oesophageal hiatus this abdominal oesophagus enter the diaphragm in a company with the uh, vagal nerves the right and left vagal nerves the tentacular nerves and in that position the vagal nerves could be now described as gastric nerves they are the same of the vagal nerves but the name is changed and they are called anterior and posterior gastric nerves because their position changes the left becomes anterior and the right becomes posterior and when the oesophagus is connected with the stomach the gastric nerves run along the lesser curvature of the stomach with the gastric arteries or vessels Uh, the connection of the 
abdominal oesophagus with the stomach, which is the lower end of the abdominal oesophagus, is considered as a region of anastomosis between veins of the liver, which is the portal vein, venous system, and the systemic veins, because here the uh, lower end of the oesophagus have some venous drainage that goes up to the azygous vein and hemiazygous vein and then to the superior vena cava and some of the veins going to the portal vein. And so this is the lower end of the oesophagus at the uh, cardiac opening of the stomach is a site of portosystemic anastomosis. So sometimes if there is uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, the liver cirrhosis is associated with fibrosis of the liver. And this fibrosis uh, and cirrhosis uh, prevent the portal venous blood from passing inside the liver, then passing or reaching to the inferior vena cava and then to the heart. So the portal vein will not uh, the portal venous blood will not be able to pass through the liver to reach the inferior vena cava and therefore the pressure in the portal vein will increase which is called portal venous hypertension and as a result of this portal venous hypertension blood from the portal vein will pass via the left gastric vein to the lower end of the oesophagus and then the blood will ascend up to the azygous system of vein to reach the superior vena cava as an alternative pathway because uh, portal venous blood is not able to pass into the liver so it will find another pathway via the lower end of the oesophagus uh, by the uh, left gastric vein and then from that the venous blood will pass to the azygous system to the superior vena cava. So, we will find that this region, the porto systemic anastomosis at the lower end of the esophagus will show dilated big veins because of high pressure and much blood flow. And these dilated veins are called esophageal varices. Uh, these dilated veins could be seen clearly from inside, from the mucosa, if you do an endoscope for the esophagus. This dilated vein may be ruptured, for example, by a food or due to high pressure, and thus much bleeding will occur, and the blood will be collected in the stomach, and when the patient will vomit this blood, it will lead to blood vomiting, which is called hematemesis, as a result of esophageal varicosities, as a result of portal venous hypertension, as a result of liver cirrhosis. This is uh, mostly about the uh, oesophagus, and now I will talk about the stomach. The stomach is uh, distensible. Uh, organ, it could be dilated and uh, decrease in size. It is a dilated part or dilated organ. The shape of it when it is empty is in form of uh, a um, uh, J-shaped muscular back. If you consider the nine regions surface anatomy of the abdomen, the empty stomach which is inverted J-shaped uh, occupy the epigastrium and left hypochondrium and umbilical region of the inferior abdominal wall nine region although the obese stomach is extending to much more this much more than this anatomically the stomach is uh, described in term of the rule of two you can say that the stomach has two orifices or two opening one of them is the opening with the lower end of the oesophagus which is called the cardiac orifice 
and the other is the opening with the duodenum, which is the pyloric orifice or the uh, opening. The cardiac orifice with the oesophagus is uh, guarded by a physiological sphincter. If you open the inside or the wall of this orifice, you will not find a thickening in the muscular layer of the lower end of the oesophagus here, so it is not a thickening of the muscle, so it is not anatomical sphincter. The sphincter here is called physiological. It occurs by the uh, stimulation of neuronal stimulation to the muscles available here. This opening is at the level of T11 vertebra, or we can say it is uh, lying behind the seventh costal cartilage. While the pyloric orifice, which is the opening with the duodenum, shows an anatomical sphincter. Because if you cut the wall here, you will find that the muscle is sticking in form of anatomical sphincter. This opening lies at the level of the first lumbar vertebrae to the right of midline. And uh, in living during operation, you may find here a vein which is called prepyloric vein that considered as a landmark for the pyloric orifice in surgery, during surgery, prepyloric vein. So the stomach has two orifices, the cardiac and the pyloric orifice. Also, the stomach, according to the rule of two, has two curvatures. The upper border is the lesser curvature, which is concave, and it continues with the right border of the oesophagus. And the lower border is called the greater curvature, which is convex, that is separated from the uh, left border of the oesophagus by the cardiac notch. And also we can see that the lesser curvature, which is the upper border, shows a dependent notch, which is called angular notch. So you have cardiac notch between the greater curvature of the stomach and the left border of oesophagus, and angular notch at the dependence of the lesser curvature. The angular notch is sometimes described as uh, incisora angularis. Keeping on with the rule of two, the stomach therefore has two notches, cardiac notch and angular notch, which is called incisora angularis. Also, the stomach has two surfaces. The rule of two an anterior surface that is covered by the left lobe of the liver, by the diaphragm and ribs, and by anterior abdominal wall. And posterior surface, which is related to structures forming the bed of the stomach, which are demonstrated here, including the left kidney, the left suprarenal gland, the spleen, the pancreas and the transverse colon and the transverse mesocolon. All these structures forming the stomach bed are included in the posterior wall of omental bursa, the lesser sac, except of the spleen. Still in the rule of two. The stomach has two parts, each part is divided into two. The two parts of the stomach are divided by the imaginary line starting from the angular notch from the incisor angularis. This imaginary line passes downward and to the left and thus this line divides the stomach into a proximal big part which is called cardiac part and a distal small part which is called pyloric part. The proximal big part which is the cardiac part is divided by the horizontal imaginary line running to the left from the cardiac notch. If you draw imaginary line horizontally from the cardiac notch, this horizontal imaginary line would divide the large proximal cardiac part of the stomach into upper fundus and lower body. And you can see uh, 
the fundus clearly in x-ray of the stomach because in erect position uh, if you take an x-ray to the stomach you will find the fundus is filled with air which is a normal finding so the upper proximal part which is cardiac part is divided into fundus and body by horizontal imaginary line running to the left from the cardiac notch while the distal pyloric part of the uh, stomach is divided into a distal cylindrical pyloric canal and the proximal dilated pyloric antrum the stomach is an intraperitoneal organ because it is suspended by the lesser and the greater omentum or oh, the stomach is surrounded by peritoneum you need to revise the uh, presentation of the peritoneum to see what we meant by that the stomach is intraperitoneal organ an exception to this rule is a small triangular area behind the cardiac orifice of the stomach where the oesophagus is connected with the stomach behind the connection of the oesophagus with the stomach there is a small triangular area in which uh, the stomach is directly related or attached to the diaphragm and here this triangular area is not covered by peritoneum it is very small area uh, near the attachment of the oesophagus with the stomach and is called bare area of the stomach the inside the mucosa of the stomach shows many folds when it is empty these folds are called rugi apart from these folds there are longitudinal folds of the mucosa along the lesser curvature of the stomach these longitudinal folds are called gastric canal and they are not uh, uh, disappeared when the stomach is filled they are constant folds the function of these longitudinal gastric canal, the folds of mucosa along the lesser curvature, is that they transmit the fluid from the oesophagus through the gastric canal down to the duodenum directly. So, in cold region, they claim that in cold region uh, on Earth, uh, usually people drink many hot fluid and therefore this gastric canal is exposed always to hot fluid and so ulceration may occur here more common than other regions of the stomach blood supply to the stomach includes the following first left and right gastric arteries running along the lesser curvature of the stomach with the gastric nerves you will know in the presentation of the blood vessels that the left gastric is a branch of celiac trunk while the right gastric is a branch from the uh, common hepatic or gastrointestinal artery also the stomach is supplied by the right and left gastroepiploic vessels that are running on the a greater curvature of the stomach between the first and second layer of the uh, greater omentum. Uh, this gastroepiploic vessels gives up gastric branches to the stomach and down epiploic branches to the greater omentum. Apart from these four arteries, the splenic artery branch of the gas of the celiac trunk gives also five to seven short gastric branches that are passing through the gastrocyplenic ligament to the fundus of the stomach then. regarding the lymphatic drainage of the stomach I think that uh, this is a practical a theoretical aspect and I'm presenting a practical aspect about the duodenum of the stomach so I will leave that to your lecture what is written in your lecture 
regarding the nerve supply of course the stomach is supplied parasympathetic by parasympathetic vagal nerves which are gastric nerves and are supplied by the sympathetic nerves which are from T6 to T10 if you go back to the presentation of anterior abdominal wall you will find that the skin of the anterior abdominal wall is supplied by the lower six thoracic nerves and the L1 and you will find that the level of the umbilicus is T10 the skin of the uh, at the level of the umbilicus is supplied by T10 and you can go above the umbilicus T9, T8 and T7 will be below the uh, sternum and the infrasternal angle therefore you can imagine that pain from the stomach transmitted via the sympathetic nerves could be felt in the level from the lower end of the oesophagus down to the umbilicus because sympathetic innervation is from the T6 and T10 and the dermatom of these nerves in the anterior abdominal wall is from the lower end of the sternum to the umbilicus so pain in this region above the umbilicus is a pain uh, maybe from the stomach this is all about the stomach regarding the anatomy of the duodenum the duodenum begins after the stomach and therefore the duodenum is small intestine but it is a fixed part not movable part of small intestine the small intestine is formed of duodenum jejunum and ileum and the duodenum is the fixed part not movable part of the small intestine it is fixed and is lying in a configuration just like the letter c so it is a c-shaped fixed part of small intestine this duodenum, the C-shaped duodenum, has four parts. This is the first part after the pyloric orifice of the stomach, which is running to the right, horizontally upward and backward. After the pyloric orifice of the stomach. It is covered, the first part, which is this part, covered by the right lobe of the liver and even uh, covered by uh, bladder in cadaver always we find greenish coloration of the uh, bile on the first part of duodenum because the first part of duodenum is covered by the right lobe of liver and the gallbladder uh, the first two centimeters of the uh, first part of duodenum or first lobe of first inch of the first part of duodenum is suspended by the lesser omentum you remember i think from the presentation of the duodenum that uh, the uh, from the presentation of the peritoneum that the lesser omentum extend between the liver and stomach and between the liver and the first two centimeters of duodenum and therefore the lesser omentum has two parts hepatogastric part and hepatodudinal part so the first inch or two centimeter of first part of the numb is suspended by the lesser omentum. And therefore, this first two centimeter is considered to be an intraperitoneal part of the numb, not a retroperitoneal just like the others. And therefore, it is a movable part, not fixed part of the numb. You can see that above this first part of duodenum, therefore, is the right free border of lesser omentum. And therefore, if you consider relation of the first part of the uh, duodenum, you will say above the first part is the epiplavic foramen of Winslow. Below the first part is the pancreas. And... Uh, you know that the free border of lesser omentum contains the bile duct, hepatic artery, and behind these is the portal vein. Therefore, the bile duct and uh, portal vein 
uh, and gastrodudinal artery will pass behind the first part of duodenum. So relation of the first part of duodenum including above epiploic foramen, below the pancreas, posteriorly bile duct, portal vein and gastrodudinal artery. The second part of duodenum, of course, this is the first part going to the right, upward and backward. The second part descends vertically downward. This is the second part. It is retroperitoneal and fixed. Here you have the attachment of root of transverse colon, a transverse mesocolon. Sometimes the region between the margins of the attachment this region is called bare area of the second part of duodenum because here there is attachment to the uh, to, by, by the uh, root of mesentery of transverse colon transverse mesocolon but generally the second part is uh, a vertical part is fixed part is retroperitoneal uh, as it is running vertically it is limited above by an angle and limited below by an angle the angle be above is uh, an angle with the first part, while the angle below is an angle with the third part. So this superior angle is called superior duodenal flexure, and this inferior angle is called inferior duodenal flexure. And we can say that the uh, second part of uh, duodenum uh, lies between the superior and inferior duodenal flexures. This second part of duodenum is covered anteriorly by the liver and by transverse colon and uh, transverse and this, uh, small intestine. While posterior to the second part of uh, duodenum, the vertical part is the right kidney and right psoas muscle and the inferior vena cava. And you may see the relations here. Anterior is transverse colon, below transverse colon is the small intestine and above the transverse colon is the liver, while posteriorly is the kidney, the right kidney, psoas, and inferior vena cava. While medially to the second part is the pancreas, as you can see. The third part of the duodenum is running horizontally to the left after the inferior duodenum flexure. Again, it is uh, fixed retroperitoneum. Also here the root of mesentery of small intestine crossing the third part of duodenum. And at this region where the root of mesentery crossing the third part, the superior mesenteric vessels are also crossing the third part of duodenum to enter the root of mesentery of small intestine. So we may call also this region as bare area of the third part of duodenum. But generally, all the third part is retroperitoneal fixed. Uh, the first part of dunam lies at the level of L1 vertebra. The second part lies at the level of L1, L2, L3, and therefore the third part lies at the level of L3 vertebra. Relation to the third part anteriorly is the root of mesentery and superior mesenteric vessels, and behind it is the right psoas and inferior vena cava and uh, above it is the pancreas, the head of pancreas. The fourth part starts after the third part. This is the fourth part. You can see that the fourth part, this is the third part horizontal, the fourth part ascends up after the third part. Why is that? Why the fourth part is ascending up after the third part? Because as this figure shows, after the third part, the fourth part is ascending up because it is pulled by a ligament which is called suspensory ligament of a treads. This ligament is extending from the right across of the diaphragm to the duodenal junction and so pulling the fourth part of the duodenum up. The fourth part uh, is running up and to the left and so it ascends to the 
uh, at the level of uh, uh, L2 because the third part is at L3 so it ascends to the level of L2 and uh, here the duodenal junction is suspended by the root of mesentery of small intestine so it is movable and also sometimes some textbook consider it as intraperitoneal just like the first two centimeter of the uh, first part of duodenum which is suspended by the lesser omentum and therefore the first two centimeter of first part of duodenum is considered to be intraperitoneal movable also the duodenal junction is suspended by the mesentery of small intestine Nerve supply to the duodenum is the same of nerve supply of the stomach from the anterior and posterior gastric nerve and from the parasympathetic top, of course, and the, the uh, T6 to T10 sympathetic. Therefore, pain from ulcer in the duodenum is also felt in the abdominal wall above the umbilicus, and you could not clinically decide if the pain of ulcer is coming from a gastric ulcer or pancreatic ulcer because the referred pain of gastric ulcer is in the same location of the referred pain from duodenal ulcer both of them are felt in the epigastric region above the umbilicus and uh, you will not be able to say that this is a duodenal pain while this is a gastric pain of ulcer unless you do an endoscope Finally, we have to say something about the anatomy of the spleen. The spleen is a wedge-shaped organ, pyramidal-shaped organ, lying in the left hypochondrium, according to the nine region of surface anatomy of the abdominal wall. Its anterior end is wide. You can see that the anterior end is wide while its posterior end is pointed or narrow or rounded the reason behind that is that this anterior end which is wide is compressed by the splenic flexure of the colon this is the splenic flexure the splenic angle of the colon it compresses the spleen anteriorly thus the anterior of the end of the spleen is wide forming a colic area or colic impression Uh, the spleen lies obliquely in the uh, upper left side of the abdominal cavity and its obliquity if you draw a line from the posterior end to the anterior end this obliquity of the spleen corresponds to the obliquity of the tenth rib and actually the spleen uh, accordingly is related to the nine ten 11 ribs, but the 11th rib represents the obliquity of the axis of the spleen. And if there is a fracture from uh, of the rib, from for example, car accident, if the fracture involves the 9, 10, and 11 ribs, there will be uh, an injury to the spleen, rupture spleen. Uh, the spleen has two surfaces it has a lateral convex smooth diaphragmatic surface that is related to the diaphragm and a medial irregular surface which is visceral surface the lateral is diaphragmatic you can see that the medial visceral surface shows above a fossa for the stomach, for the uh, fundus of the stomach, and the fossa below for the kidney, for the left kidney. And the fossa above for the stomach lies between an upper border and intermediate border, while the fossa below, which is for the left kidney, lie between the intermediate border and a lower border. The intermediate border is the hilum of the spleen through which the splenic vessels, nerves, and lymphatics are passing 
and also the highland, the intermediate border is related to the tail of the pancreas. The upper border shows a notch anteriorly near the anterior end, which is called splenic notch. This splenic notch is very important clinically because this notch could be felt from the anterior abdominal wall if the spleen is enlarged. Normally, you cannot feel the spleen or the liver below the costal margin. But if the liver or spleen is enlarged, you may be able to feel them. And if you find a mass below the left costal margin, you have to say this is a spleen. If you feel the notch in this mass, which is splenic notch, otherwise it may be um, uh, something else other than a spleen. You cannot say uh, if you feel a mass below the left costal margin, you cannot say that I'm feeling the enlarged spleen because uh, unless you feel the splenic notch, which is a notch in the upper border that deviates below the costal margin if the spleen is enlarged. Regarding the dimensions or the measurements, the spleen uh, follows the odd numbers, one, three, five, seven. It's one inch thick, three inch width, five inch length, seven ounces weight, the odd numbers. That's all. I hope I'm helping. Thank you very much.